Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 29th lecture of the course on Sociological Perspectives on Modernity. We are in the last module of this course that is a new totality. Till now we have discussed the thematic preliminaries, sociological modernism through the works of Marx and Weber the structuralist interpretation through the works of Levi Strauss and Althusser, Western Marxist perspectives on critical modernist paradigm in sociology through the works of Lukacs, Gramsci and Turin. Then we have discussed synthesizing modernity and social theory through the works of Wallerstein, Giddens and Habermas. And then we have discussed deconstruction of modernity through three important vantage points namely feminism, cultural studies and postmodernism. And then we have we are in the in the stage of a new totality where we try to evaluate all four critical pillars of critical modernist paradigm in sociology namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. And then we have also tried to discuss radicalized modernity through, through neo Weberian and neo Marxist perspectives. When I say neo Weberian, I think I, 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 I am sure we have discussed the way Giddens tried to unfurl different strategies of coping with and interrogating modernity. And when I say neo Marxist, I try to reflect on Habermas's works uh, uh, on engaging with and interrogating modernity. And, and in this lecture, we will discuss modernity in Indian contexts. How different authors, how different writers, how different thinkers could reflect on what is modernity, what constitutes modernity in Indian context. Because modernity, the way we visualized in, in the West, in Europe, in North America must be different in the context of Latin America, Africa, Asia and in our, con in, in, in our case India assumes greater significance. In this lecture very briefly we will discuss the thought currents of or, or the perspectives on modernity by Gandhi, Tagore. Amartya Sen and Dipankar Gupta. Okay. It does not imply that modernity cannot be visualized in terms of Nehru or, or somebody else. I am trying to limit this, this discussion through different modes of engaging with and interrogating modernity, different modes of practicing modernity. Okay. Now, first let us see how Gandhi, Tagore, Nehru, they tried to visualize modernity because Gandhi, Tagore, um, Nehru, all these, the, especially these three, they were trying to operate, they were trying to envision modernity during the freedom struggle. Things were pretty different. I mean, uh, India was a colonized nation. Okay, India was colonized for almost two centuries. Gandhi had just come back from South Africa after carrying out uh, social and political revolution against racism in the erstwhile South Africa. Nehru was trying to stamp 
Nehru was tr trying to stamp the authority of science on Indian economy, culture and polity. And Tagore in, a, in, in one of the most articulative ways was trying to interrogate the form of knowledge, the truth, not by engaging only Indian ways of cultivating wisdom, but also borrowing those ideas from the West by, by integrating both forms of knowledge system. Okay. The context was the freedom movement, the context was the two world wars, I mean the first world war and the second world war and especially the, the interwar period is very important between period between the first world war and the second world war precisely because that, that phase defined what kind of nation India was going to build. Okay. This interwar period is very important. The, this period also marked the, the rise of nationalism and end of colonialism. This period also was is, is significant for, for many, many, many different reasons, okay. because during the freedom struggle, what kind of India we wanted? Gandhi had different vision. Nehru had a different vision, Tagore had a different vision. For example, Mokshagundam Vishweshwaraya had a different vision, Malviya had a different vision, Meghnad Saha, Humi Bhava, they had different visions, Subhash Chandra Bose, he had a different vision. Okay. Now, when we try to look at what kind of modern India that, that Gandhi wanted to encapsulate, Gandhi wanted to envision. Let us first see. During and after the first world war, the program of the Indian National Congress then of reviving and restoring traditional industries and crafts was not only going was not only operational, but also parallel developments favorable to the advancement of modern science and technology were also set in motion. On a, on, a, on a global scale, in the aftermath of the First World War and the achievements of the socialist experiments in the erstwhile Soviet Union unveiled the, the immense potentialities of science for mankind in terms of the economy and material progress. Furthermore, the global economic crisis in the form of the Great Depression of the 1930s precisely 1929 to 1933 and the subsequent crisis of the bipolar world compelled the human, uh, I mean compelled the Indian leadership, Indian political leadership to have a fresh look at each aspect of society, be it social, economic or political. And in this process, the earlier Indian National Congress policy as a whole and the Gandhian philosophy to a great extent gave way to new forces of change. Why I am using Gandhian philosophy, this term Gandhian philosophy needs to be explained here. Under the leadership of Gandhi, the Indian National Congress accorded prime importance to cottage industries and, and Khadar during 1920 to 1935. In fact, in Hind Swaraj, Gandhi wrote, Khadi to me is the symbol of unity of Indian humanity of its economic freedom and equality and therefore ultimately in the poetic expression of Nehru the livery of India's freedom. It involved technology based on animate sources of energy, dexterity and skill. That is why if you, if you look at this portion that I wanted to highlight that if India copies England, it is my firm conviction that she will be ruined. Civilization is not an incurable disease but it should never be forgotten that the English people are at present afflicted by it. In Hind Swaraj in 1909, uh, Gandhi wrote this. For Gandhi, health, hygiene and sanitation together with indigenous systems of medicine, especially Ayurveda and Yunani were given a high place 
in the in the Gandhian scheme in particular and the Congress programs in general. The world was then gasping after being ravaged by the horrendous crimes and casualties perpetrated by the by by the First World War. The national economies of most of the countries uh, uh, were in setters. Uh, international trade touched the lowest ebb. Probably the repercussions of the First World War were so much so much of machines, technologies, and also the Second World War. We saw the use of bomb. Okay. Uh, atom bomb okay, uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Perhaps, perhaps the repercussions of such wars forced the INC to go for these indigenous systems of knowledge or medicine. Gandhi also practiced naturopathy. Meanwhile, Gandhi maintained a hostile indifference to modern science, attacked modern civilization, I mean European British civilization and looked upon machines as an evil. Traditional industries and khadar, okay, hum, homespun cloth, I mean khadi, formed the basic content of the Congress economic, social, and political policies. As late as 1938, the, the Indian National Congress remained preoccupied with evolving a system of national education, I mean, national education policy, I mean, national planning committee was also formed which was then envisaged in a system called basic education. And none of these exercises nevertheless offered any prospect for the advancement of science and technology. As a practical tool, the Indian National Congress succeeded in welding national unity and patriotism, but it utterly failed to cope with the changed material conditions. Therein, the, therein lies the significance of Tagore. When Tagore was questioned, what is more important, whether patriotism or, uh, or nationalism or, uh, or, uh, or humanity? He said, uh, uh, I prefer humanity because nationalism and patriotism have divided the nations into different worlds altogether, different societies altogether. But humanity does not pro, does not divide in a particular geographical um, territory. Okay? This is very important. In this sense, the INC policy did not change the material conditions of the people. And in this context, Gandhi had reservations in opposing science in the first two decades of the 20th century. But he tried to relocate modern science and technology in a new fashion during 1920s and 1930s. The time and context, of course, are of supreme importance. I mean, at that time, India was amidst freedom struggle. In 1919, uh, we have seen uh, Jalia massacre, 21 non-cooperation non movement, 30, 31, I mean, civil disobedience movement and so on. And uh, that's why I said the time and context uh, are of, uh, perhaps, perhaps are of uh, supreme importance, which reflect a deep-rooted Gandhian philosophy. And in this regard, Gandhi wrote this, if India copies England, it is my firm conviction that she will be ruined. Civilization is not an incurable disease, but it should never be forgotten that the English people are at present afflicted by it. Before the mid-1930s, opting for modern science and technology was definitely a progressive step, but being possessed of it was far away from reality. And during this period, people were illiterate, superstitious and were rooted in tradition. In such a situation, traditional industries promised wider acceptance, feasibility and self-reliance, where, whereas modern industries uh, implied immediate dependence on the West. A sudden shift from technology based on animate sources of energy to technology based on inanimate sources of energy was perhaps not possible and Gandhi understood this. Okay? That was why both the INC leaders and eminent Indian scientists of the time, particularly Saha and Bhava, Meghnath Saha and Homi Jahangir Bhava, emphasized general material progress as well as education at the lower level for creating a more favorable condition for the growth of modern science. This is very important. And Gandhi began to express his reservations about science and modern machines as early as 1909, I mean in Hind Swaraj, but it was only around 1920 that he launched 
and they attack with full vigor. Thereafter, he attacked them both in word and action. However, he started reconsidering the whole question almost at the same time. He compromised on the question, question progressively and eventually found machines not entirely useless. That's how Gandhi viewed modern India. If India has to make progress, then India has to evolve its own technology. India cannot keep on copying the West for its for the evolution of technology. India must build its own scientific temple. India cannot be reduced to only European scientific temple or North American scientific temple. Contrary to this, on the contrary, Nehru had different visions. Nehru was a propagator of modern science, heavy industrialization and socialism. Both heavy industrialization and socialism stood on the foundation of modern science and technology. In 1936, in the presidential address at the annual Indian National Congress session, Nehru declared that I am convinced that the only key to the solution of the world problems lies in socialism and when I use this word, I do so not in a vague humanitarian way, but in the scientific economic sense. I believe in the rapid industrialization of the country and only thus I think will the standard of the people rise substantially and poverty be combated. Suppose for Meghnath Shah, what was, what was, what constitutes modernity? What constitutes modern India? What constitutes modern science? For Meghnath Shah, the problem of Indian science is the problem of living for India's millions. If science cannot eradicate poverty, science cannot eradicate unemployment, science cannot eradicate squalor, diseases, then there is no meaning of such science. For, for Sah, Sahab looked at the applicational aspects of science. Okay. Similarly, Nehru's message on the occasion of the Silver Jubilee of the Indian Cong Science Congress Association assumes greater significance. He said, Congress represents science. And science is the spirit of the age and the dominating factor of the modern world. Even more than the present, the future belongs to science and to those who make friends with science and seek, seek itself for the advancement of humanity. Okay. Such, such, such uh, celebratory proclamation uh, reflects an unflinching penchant on, on the part of Nehru for science as a means for advancement of humanity in general and of India in particular and becomes a conscious invitation to science as a defining feature of the Indian National Congress of both the present as well as the future. Because the image of nation building that India was trying to sketch during the freedom struggle assumes greater significance. What kind of modern India that I am you are going to sketch? Okay. That apart, this 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 this, this future belongs to science. Okay. It involves within it an implicit reference to the inevitable success to be achieved by science as a means of development through the INC as a political weapon if employed. Hence, the Indian National Congress would strongly advocate both the acquisition of scientific knowledge and its application in all productive domains. Of, of course, of course, uh, it's, uh, I mean, what, what, uh, this, this also can be challenged. I mean, this faith is based on the advancements already made and the future promises in science and technology ahead. Here, both nationalism and modernity can be realized as one finds the causal linkages between modern science and technology on the one hand and, and, and socio-economic transformation being uh, on the other being articulated. Science was an essential, indeed basic cultural element of the India which Nehru sought and worked so hard to build. Nehru fully realized that modern science and technology were as necessary for a highly developed agriculture as for industry. He argued that the cause of the growth of agriculture in many other countries was because of the application of science and technology. In Nehru's vision, modern life depended so much on science and technology that we must seize hold of them, understand them and apply them. He saw the essential role of science in its historical perspective, how science has evolved over a period of time and across space. Not only in transforming the, the material environment, but also transforming human beings. That's what I mean, he, he followed uh, Marx's uh, notion that by acting upon nature, human beings not only change nature, but also change themselves. I mean, human beings also change the 
the, the social relations involved in it. Okay? Not only Nehru, but erudite scholars and the best planners of the country like Mokshagundam Vishweshwaraya okay, uh, said Nehru's vision and perspective and exercised their, their uh, uh, influence in shaping the science policy in post-colonial India. I mean, if you, if you want to look at how to integrate technology and planning in India, please look at Mokshagundam Vishweshwaraya, okay? the one of Mysore, uh, uh, fantastic um, uh, uh, engineer of, of his time. Okay? This is very important. When, when, we, when we come to, to, to the discussion on Tagore, Tagore uh, is extremely important in, 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 uh, while visualizing. Tagore said most of the views of Gandhi, but Tagore opposed Gandhi on different counts. Tagore was a, was, a, was a person perhaps who could integrate both traditional as well as western forms of wisdom and knowledge. Absolutely a rational human being. He had uh, seen the world in its entirety, in its totality. He used to question Gandhi on scientific terms. He in fact questioned Gandhi that you cannot go back, you have to move forward. If you look at, for example, the argumentative Indian by, by Amartya Sen or development as freedom by Amartya Sen or poverty and famines or, um, or inequality re-examined, the political economy of development in India by, by John Drees, Amartya Sen and, and his colleagues. Sen is more important, so Sen is very important in this context. When you look at these this phenomena, I mean these, these authors. For Sen, we cannot sketch even an, an iota of modernity if people are not capable of, of coming out of poverty. Today's world which has seen unprecedented opulence, opulence in sense, in, in, in sense of what? For Sen, it is unprecedented opulence of not only uh, wealth, but also inequality, hunger, poverty, unemployment, unprecedented uh, opulence of, of uh, exploitation of, of few human beings, of rather unprecedented opulence of exploitation of, by a few human beings over large chunk of the population. This, is, this cannot be a constituent of modernity. This cannot be a part and parcel of modernity for sin. One must be entitled to have food. One must have the basic right to food. And therein lies the significance of uh, democratic participation. Therein lies the significance of the spirit of decolonization. Okay? This is very important. Okay? Suppose, suppose for, for, for Dipankar Gupta, what is meant by the term modernity? Is it about uh, being technologically acquisitive and inhabiting places that are uh, plus and expensive? Or is it a certain attitude that we bring to bear in our relations with other people? Dipankar Gupta, famously known as DG, by by students community, we all know him as, as DG. What DG suggests that just by wearing good garments or by speaking better English, does it make a person modern? He interrogates this. And then he suggests that there is a lack of clarity on this issue which often leads to very untidy conclusions. In most cases, modernity is identified with anything that is contemporary. If it is happening now, then it must be modern. Consequently, Fundamentalism becomes an aspect of modernity and so do caste wars. Liberalization, socialism, globalization are some of the other features identified with modernity. Surely, there is a gap between fundamentalism and liberalization. How can the two be dimensions of the same phenomenon? When faced with this difficulty, many have chosen the softer route and opted the term multiple modernity. Undoubtedly, there is something attractive about this phrase, but 
but isn't there a fair amount of pretense involved in taking this position? The outcome of opting for multiple modernities would be to say that each of us is modern in her or his own way, yet nowhere is it made clear what is modern. Are we then talking about different kinds of modernity or of different manifestations of a single modernity? The two are not same. I mean, different kinds of modernity and different manifestations of a single modernity, they are not same. That is what earlier I said, uh, people, uh, uh, postmodernists suggest that no, there are multiple truths, but the critics to postmodernism suggest uh, that no. Uh, there are not multiple truths, there is only one truth, but from a multifarious and multifaceted dimensions. Okay? There are different models of inquiry. Then, then, then what is modernity for DG? According to Dipankar Gupta, modernity has been misrecognized in India because of the tendency to equate it with technology and with other contemporary artifacts, maybe language maybe religion, maybe region, maybe access to information. And the possession of modern technology, however, does not always signal modernity. Modernity has to do with attitudes, especially those that come into play in social relations. A modern society is one in which at least the following characteristics must be present. What are those characteristics? First, dignity of the individual, secondly, adherence to universalistic norms, thirdly, elevation of individual achievement over privileges or disprivileges of birth and fourthly, accountability in public life. Let us see what, what DG means by this. Once these attributes are in place, once these features are in place, characteristics are in place, it does not really matter if there is high level technology, super fast transit systems or consumerism. Generally speaking, technology and consumerism as are consequences of the four characteristics of modernity just that we have discussed just now and do not by themselves constitute modernity. Whether you have technology or consumerism, consumerist culture or they do not constitute modernity, but they are byproducts of these four characteristics of modernity. In India, we have not paid attention to the mainsprings of modernity, but have been quick to declare certain sectors as modern because of their acquisition of artifacts and technology. This has also led to frequent complaints against modernity, especially when egregious offenses are committed in contemporary locals or their perpetrators are those who were mistakenly seen as modern because they possessed expensive material objects. In this way, sexual harassment, violence in public places, dowry deaths and a host of other fairly uncivilized forms of conduct get posted as modern. Looked at closely, none of these things is really modern. They are beastly. They are carryovers of attitudes from the past. The abuse of women, the demonstration of family connections and the refusal to abide by norms are actually traditional attributes. But if these are manifest today in a bar, a hotel or in a university, chances that Chances are that people would shake their heads and lament on the curse that modernity has brought upon us. An analysis of contemporary India will reveal that while there has been a definite move from tradition, what we see around us is not yet modern. If, we clo if the clock were to stop here, the final diagnosis would or rather should declare India is still unmodern. Modernity always comes in baby steps, more so in a country like India where tradition was not only deeply entrenched but also highly elaborated in all walks of life. Perhaps for this reason, I mean traditional India was perhaps the most stratified society in the world as it ritually sanctioned the separation among human beings on the basis of caste in such fine detail. It, is the, it, is, it was perhaps the most stratified society in the world. The effects of this can be felt even today in India. While industrialization has indeed made a difference and so has democratic politics, there is still a long way to go. This is because the advances of industrialization and politics have largely been cornered by members of the traditional elites. 
In some cases where these traditional elites have been displaced, the new ruling class has not heralded a modern outlook. Because the new ruling class also belongs to that traditional beastly outlook, okay? but has instead adopted the values of its predecessors. Consequently, the old elite classes have not been pressured in any significant way. Okay? Modernity cannot be held up forever, but it can take a very long time in countries like India. According to Dipankar Gupta, an additional and concerted pose is required to further its progress. This can happen in part at the conscious level once we realize what modernity is all about and who its friends and enemies are. It is not as if modernity is an exercise in willpower alone. No, indeed a modern attitude develops not so much because people choose to adopt it but rather because there is little scope for choice in this matter. The social conditions that favor and encourage modernity must be paid attention to. If modernity implies the four features that we, we have discussed, the dignity of the individual, adherence to universalistic norms, elevation of individual achievement over privileges or disprivileges of birth and accountability in, in public life, if, if modernity implies this, this, at least these four features, the only way they have a reasonable chance of coming into existence is when significant members from the lower classes graduate to the level of the middle class and when the economic structure allows for a great degree of social mobility. Obviously, for all this to happen, industrialization is absolutely essential. Okay? Now, Dipankar Gupta goes back to the proponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. But what has often been overlooked is that industrialization is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of modernity. Therein he deviates from the, the proponents of critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Generations may live and die by factory stacks, conveyor belts and rapid wheels and yet not experience true modernity. It is at this point that a heightened self-consciousness uh, uh, of what modernity really is can act as a catalyst to hasten the process. After all, we have just one lifetime for, for uh, as, as Dipankar Gupta uh, posits. So, why not act in full consciousness of the burden of our beings. Hopefully, this book will, I mean, I mean, hopefully, uh, this, this, this such, such argument will stoke some dying uh, embers in our, uh, our collective consciousness and take us a little further towards realizing modernity. And, and for, for Dipankar Gupta, it is in this limited sense that we place our hopes in human agency. Again, he, he, he goes back to Marx, he goes back to Western Marxist tradition, not structuralist, because for structuralist, there is no role of human agency. But for Marx, for Western Marxist, for, for Wallerstein, I mean, human agency assumes more, more significance, okay? not structure. Okay. Modernity as relations between people, I mean, I mean modernity must be practiced. It is often easily overlooked that developed modernity is characterized by an attitude of equality with and respect for others. It is not as if in a modern society all are actually equal. Yet, in spite of the many differences that exist among people, modernity demands a baseline similarity to so that people can live with dignity, dignity of the individual people can live with dignity and, and realistically avail of opportunities to better their conditions of existence. Okay? This is very important. It is on this bedrock of equality that other differences and inequalities can be added on. But the foundational equality cannot be compromised for it is on, on this that claims of citizenship are made in modern societies. In traditional orders, there were rulers and subjects, but no citizens. And this is what what decolonization has given to us, that we are no longer uh, subjects, but now we are citizens. But in, 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 in this chaotic Indian society today, given the nature of the state today, okay, what we see that we are, we are, all of us are not treated equally. We have some, some people are uh, rulers, some people are citizens, some people are, have become subjects. And thus, modernity can only come into being 
when intersubjectivity is a, is a central concern. But intersubjectivity does not come easily. Intersubjectivity is about being able to participate in one another's lives and share in one another's fate. Even if we are located at structurally different points in, in terms of our occupations and skills, the distances should not be of the kind that we cannot imagine what it is like to be in someone else's shoes. Intersubjectivity therefore uh, arouses the, the quality of empathy, understanding the need of the other, understanding the role of the other. Okay? As, as empathy encourages a vicarious uh, participation in the lives of other people, it becomes a distinguishing trait of modernity. This and other attributes of a modern attitude help in the realization of substantive citizenship, though not legal citizenship. What is legal? The concept of law has emerged with by taking violence in its side. That is why even if it is not legal, but it is substantive. But in India today, it is, it is still very difficult to work up any enthusiasm for projects which have a public utility in mind. The sense that as citizens, we, we share a common public space, implying thereby that in some very significant ways we are responsible for another's well-being, has found very few takers in India. The better off and seemingly more modern sectors are the most, are the most reluctant to actively participate as citizens for that would imply that they must treat the less privileged with greater respect. This is a sad fact that the Indian elites are not willing to fully recognize this, as that would take the mantle of modernity away from them. And developed modernity is then, then characterized by a certain distinctive attitude that comes into effect in our relations with other people. Have we not all seen or known of ultra-modern hospitals where doctors and administrators treat patients and subordinate staffs, including nurses, as clear unequals. It is also widely accepted that there are many business houses in, in India which have travelled far down the road of advanced technology and yet travelled uh, and yet decision making uh, within the farm is still run on the old tycoon principle. In such cases, not only is the management not separated from ownership, but enterprise itself is held back mm, as communications flow from, only from the top down. Further, even in corporate business as elsewhere, connections matter more than universal principles of justice and fair play. There is nothing that money and good connections cannot fix. The patron is network thus tends to survive and do rather well even in the so-called advanced sectors of the economy. And then the way Dipankar Gupta tried to unfurl the debates on modernity in India between the two worlds, okay, the, the kind of shallow middle class that we have, we have created, actually it is not middle class, but, but uh, it appears to be middle class, miscast modernizers, okay. actually we are not right, we, we are not westernized, actually we are west toxicated. We are not trying to, now the, the state suggests that no, we must make advancement, we must, there is, there is a slogan of development because and so on. But what kind of development? Is it, is it western model of development? No. It is Indian model of development? No. What kind of development? What model of development? No, it is west toxicated model of development. We are intoxicated by, by the west by the North American continent. And that is why we have not been able to create anything new. We are just trying to ape the, the western models. For example, in an interesting study conducted in the 1980s, the Center for Social Studies in Surat introduced Gandhi's new talim, new education in rural areas. But it was found that the villagers resented it. They wanted to learn, learn modern sciences and not as nai talim would have required how one should make a bullock cart or a more effective spinning wheel. Illiterate though they might have been, the rural poor realized that it was about time they moved away from traditional knowledges. Quite unknowingly they were followers of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. They too wanted to be gentlemen. Okay? I mean in the, in the, in the, 
in the matter of social mobility. And such aspirations are not recognized as legitimate by those who claim to speak on behalf of the majority of Indians. In their views, Indians should cultivate those endowed characteristics with which they have been naturally blessed. Indians would thus make good transcendentalists, sublime de devotionalists, great hosts, wonderful um, aesthetes, uh, generous neighbors and so on. But these do not make sense for, for Dipankar Gupta when we try to envision modern India. And, and the, the way Dipankar Gupta tries to reflect on having a modern India as such that he looks at the West, West toxicated elite that India has created. I mean, they are not gentlemen, but actually they have become gentuch. Okay. I mean, the, the, the tenacious tradition, I mean, the past in our present. In fact, also, of course, it is, all, it is not simply about uh, all sports, but also not about only cricket, of course. The games that the only elites play, okay, uh, and Indian face of globalization, under what circumstances we think that no, India must adopt neoliberal strategy, India, why, why can India not interrogate neoliberal policies, okay, and the way village systems are changing, okay, why even after 70 years of independence, why India is grappling with issues of caste inequality, uh, regional inequality, religious inequality, ethnic inequality and so on, gender inequality and so on. And why the new ruling class always looks at financial corruption as, as a weapon to rule, the, to rule uh, the Indian society. As if, but corruption cannot be reduced to only financial corruption, but corruption also is related to many other aspects of life, culture. Uh, economy, uh, polity, uh, institutions, ideologies and so on. And in this context, the, the kind of patriotism that uh, the debates on patriotism the, which have emerged as significant tools to rule the Indian society today, that, that is not patriotism, but predatory patriotism that Hindutva has progress uh, has occurred and it has, it is a, it has deterring effects on, on India's economic, culture and polity. And that is not simply Hindutva's progress, but also all sorts of religious fundamentalists progress which have taken place all across the continents uh, and thereby uh, it leads to abuses of religion. I mean there is, there is what we are observing that there is uh, more muscle power than, than the mental power. And the way we try to look at Dipankar Gupta's reflections on these issues is very important that uh, as, as uh, uh, Dipankar Gupta uh, uh, looks at uh, India between worlds, uh, whether there are certain glimpses of hope uh, in the context of primordial ties, the modernizers of the future, trust institutions, not individuals, okay, um, and, and how to embrace modernity in this context. These are very important uh, dimensions so far as when we discuss uh, uh, a new totality, modernity, I mean India between uh, different worlds. Okay? Uh, this is very important and one must uh, look at these aspects of modernity uh, in, in its totality, in their totality, okay? uh, in their entirety uh, and then one must try to engage with and, and, and keep on interrogating the central critical pillars of modernity namely holism or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. These are very important then, then with this we are, we are, we are, uh, we have come to uh, uh, the closure of the, the 29th lecture and in the next lecture we are going to take stock of things. What we have discussed in, 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 in the coming lecture, we are going to discuss what we have discussed in this course fully. Okay? These are the texts and references you may like to follow. Okay? Thank you.